Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our class today. Um, before, uh, like today, I will start with um, something that I couldn't do uh, last week. Um, we were talking about um, the expectation propagation uh, last week, and um, today I'm going to show uh, a particular example where, where we could use that algorithm. And I'm also um, showing, bit like, uh, like rep uh, repeating this algorithm a little bit more in detail. So, <coughs> the um, problem uh, definition of the algorithm is given like here. So we assume that we have given uh, a joint distribution over some data and variables. This is this here, and the problem is that we have is we cannot represent we we that this um, distribution is uh, intractable. We cannot directly um, optimize the. Um, this one or the posterior. What we actually want is we want to find the posterior, which is uh, the probability of the uh, parameters given the data. Um, and to um, solve this problem, we instead of um, optimizing the posterior, we optimize. We try to approximate this posterior with some other distribution Q, right? With a, a simpler distribution. And what we assume here is that Q is a factorization uh, of um, yeah, of factors which are from the expansion expansion family. So these f factors here, they have some kind of simple form, and we assume that simple means in this case uh, exponential family, special fa um, um, form they have. So <coughs> uh, the algorithm now works like this. First, um, we, uh, we initialize these uh, factors here, right? We say we have our approximation Q. And uh, Q is all the factors. So we first, we need to initialize these factors with some value. Um, then we go through all these factors. That means we start with some factor, J. Um, and we remove that factor from Q by simply be divi dividing by it. Right? We divide Q by this factor that we, that we choose. And what we obtain is something that we call the cavity distribution. This is a dif distribution that is, again, a valid distribution, but, it's, but it only contains all the factors with the exception of the uh, factor j. Then what we want to do is we find a new distribution q nu. And this q nu is defined so that it minimizes the KL divergence to this distribution, right? Where this distribution is simply the, the cavity times the true factor that we have. So we assume that we can compute this thing easily. And Instead of um, what this means, actually, is we don't really compute this distribution. What we actually compute is we only compute the moments of it, because it turns out that the Q nu that minimizes this KL divergence is exactly the one that has the same moments as this distribution. Right? This is the whole trick about it. So we don't have to really compute this distribution here. Right? It could be something, again, difficult or something that we don't exactly know how to do. But what we can do is, that's what we assume, we can compute the moments, right? The mean and the variance, and also the zeroth moment, which is simply the normalization of this thing, right? So the zeroth moment is just C, uh, zeta j, uh, z, uh, zj, which is simply the normalizer of, of all these, right? We just um, integrate over all theta about this thing, right? So this is the moment matching step where we find moments of our of, of this distribution here, right? The, the true factor times the cavity, and then we just use that moment and express our Q nu in terms of these moments. Then we have a Q nu, and now we what would we actually want to do, we would like to have an update, a new uh, representation of our factor fj tilde. And to do that, we now just have to do the same thing again. We just now divide our Q nu by the cavity and multiply with our um, normaliz normalizer here, and we get a new representation of our fj. And this is done over all like a number of times over all uh, data or of all, over all um, factors, and we can do this. Uh, can do this repeatedly, right? We can do this not only once through all the factors. We can run several times through all the factors until we have reached some kind of convergence criterion, where, for example, uh, these factors don't change anymore or or something like that. So we have some uh, criterion, and once we converge, we can then compute the. Um, uh, the uh, approximation to the so-called model evidence, which is simply this, pro uh, this probability here, which is simply like um, integrating over these, these factors here, right? This is then something we, we can compute in the end. And by this, we can then have, we can have both, right? We have both the, uh, the posterior, right? And the model evidence, P of D, 
And then we, if we just multiply them, then we get again uh, the, the joint, right? This is what we, what we are up to. Now, this is all nice. This is also another slide I showed you um, last week. This just gives you um, an um, idea of, uh, for a concrete example, uh, what the different kind of approximation techniques that we had here, um, how they look like if we have uh, this distribution here, which is non Gaussian, this, this uh, yellow um, full, uh, filled uh, sh uh, shape here. This is uh, some kind of distribution that we'd like to approximate. And we already saw something which is called the uh, Laplace appro approximation. We saw uh, a variational approach here. And now this is the expectation propagation, which is the blue curve, right? And intuitively, I would say the EP is, is, is kind of closer to what we actually want, right? Now, um, let's try to apply this theory to some concrete problem, and I think then things should be much, like, should be clearer, and it should explain better what EP actually does and how it works. Um, this is called the clutter problem. The clutter problem is defined as follows. Let's say we have some, some data, and the uh, what we'd like to do here is we'd like to fit a multivariate Gaussian into this data where we have some background clutter, right? Some uh, noise or something in the back background. Um, this example is, of course, not multivariate, but you can uh, think of this. Well, let's it, it, uh, uh, use this as a, as, a, as a simple example to visualize this. Um, so what we can do is now we can write this down as a sum of two Gaussians, and for the moment, we assume, or for this whole problem, we assume that we know this uh, value w, right? We know how much clutter we have. This is the background here. And we say that the background uh, is uh, another Gaussian, right? It's just a zero mean Gaussian, and we know a, we know the variance of that clutter, and we know how much clutter we have, right? And for every data point, we can now compute this, right? For every data point x here in our data, we can see, uh, say, the probability of that data point x, given our theta here, which is the one that we actually don't know. We don't know theta, which is the problem here. Right? But given that we know theta, we can now uh, say the probability of every data point is the Gaussian of the data point plus the clutter. And there's some, some weight between and 1 minus w is if it's not clutter, and if it's clutter, then it's w. And we also assume that the prior information on our theta is also a Gaussian here. And we know, uh, again, b here, which is the um, variance of that Gaussian, right? And it's a, it's a zero mean Gaussian, right? So th these parameters are known, A and B are known, and what we'd like to know is, is, is theta. Um, and if we do this now uh, a straightforward way, then what happens is this here. So let's say we have this data set xn to x, x1 to xn, um, then we can compute this joint distribution here, which is simply the prior times the probability of these likelihoods here. And um, this is nice, but the problem here is that all these likelihoods here, these are n, right? And we have n data points. What, what turns out is that this is a, a mixture of two to the n Gaussians, right? These are two Gaussians. And then if you multiply that with another two Gaussians, we have in the end two to the n Gaussians, right? And uh, for large n, we can't compute that, right? Not, not directly, right? Not um, exactly. Now, the idea is to instead, instead of computing this thing here, we approximate this, what we actually approximate is the posterior again, so that means we uh, compute p of theta given d, right, where we just divide by p of d. Um, and um, what we can do now is we can now approximate that with a uh, spherical Gaussian, right? So now we say um, the, the uh, posterior that we want to have is, um, and I'm showing th this here, the posterior theta given uh, d is approximately something q of theta. And um, the first thing we do is now we say that q of theta can be represented as a factor of, um, of Gaussians, of, of uh, yeah. So in, in general, q of theta is, is a th spherical Gaussian around theta, right? And we, there's some parameter m and, and v. And of course, we don't know m and v, right? This is what we had, this is the aim to, to, to uh, find now, right? We would, these parameters we'd like to find. Um, and but of course, we find them so that this q is very close to the p, right? 
this is the, the, the whole idea. Um, yeah, and, and the first thing is to write this as a factorization, like, it, like in this case here, we have like one factor f0 of theta times now all the other factors from n to big N f tilde n of theta, right? Now, compare that to the uh, factorization we have above, right? We can then say, okay, the first thing we can say is our f0 should be exactly the prior, right? Um, and every fn term now can be represented as some kind of, um, it's called the exponential quadratic form. So it's this, this form here, which says um, it's, it's a Gaussian shaped thing, but it's not really a it doesn't nece necessarily have to be uh, a valid Gaussian, right? Uh, particularly these Vn here, they could be um, negative uh, or, you know, th th this, this is like a, just a convenient way of writing it, but it's not, it doesn't have to be necessarily a true Gaussian. The only thing that we want to say is um, that this Q can be subdivided into a set of factors here, and these factors look like this, and every factor has one, two, and three parameters, and we'd like to find these parameters now. Okay, now um, the first thing we do is we initialize, in this case, we initialize every factor with the one factor. And that works in case that that, that, that can be done by simply initializing our factor Sn with this factor, uh, with this 2 pi Vn. If, if you say Sn in the beginning is set to 2 pi vn to, to the power of d, d half, then this is exactly uh, the normalizer of this, of this Gaussian. If you say mn in the beginning is 0, and vn should be 1, right? If you do that, then we will have uh, exactly that every factor in the beginning is just the one factor, right? This is to make things easy. That means that uh, in the beginning, um, we have just a prior, right? Everything is one, and, and what remains is just this, this term here, which is, which is just a prior. Yeah, now, uh, now the trick is to run through all these factors here, and for every factor, we now do these little steps in the EP step. So the first thing you do is compute the cavity distribution. The cavity distribution, again, is defined by the Q factorization divided by this one factor, right? So, um, and to do that, we have to, what we have to do is, we say Q of, Q of minus N of theta is Q of theta divided by F N tilde of theta. Now we just plug this in. We have already a representation of Q of n. We know, we, we, we assume that this is a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian of unknown parameters, but we want to find the parameters now. M and, and V times I divided by, and this is the nth, the nth factor, which is simply S n times uh, normal distribution. And now we have other parameters, M and V and I. Right? Um, and it turns out that this thing is another Gaussian-shaped thing. It's not a necessarily a, a normalized Gaussian, but it has, a, like it has a formulation like a Gaussian. And it is something like another Gaussian where we have like this theta, and this Gaussian has, of course, a mean and a sigma. Right? And... Um, now the question is simply, how, what are these mu and sigma, right? Like how can we, and this is just dividing this, right? Assume we know m and, uh, m and mn and this and these parameters, we can um, directly compute these parameters of this of the resulting Gaussian. That means m minus n equals, this is just by plugging this thing in and dividing it by yourself, right? This is a formulation for a Gaussian, you divide it by this Gaussian, you have exponential of this, divide by exponential of this, which in the end is, is, a, is a difference between these exponentials, right? And what, what if you do that on your own, and it ta will take you a bit, it's a, it's a, I did this and it's, it's a nice uh, exercise, it gives you um, this formulation, m plus 
this is uh, Vn to the minus 1, um, m minus mn, and V minus n to the to square equals V to the minus n minus Vn to the minus 1. So what this means is, first we start with this here, the Gaussian that remain that uh, t uh, turns out here has this variance and this mean. Right? This variance is just, that's, that's what happens very often, that um, one over the variance that, that comes out here is just one over the variance of this one minus one over the variance of this one. Right? You have these two Gaussians here, this one and this one, you divide one by the other, and the remaining Gaussian has this kind of, uh, has this kind of um, um, variance. Right? And this variance goes in here again, I think that was a. This is probably should be minus one here, minus n here. So this variance goes in here, right? And and we have like a like a compact. If you if you write this down, uh, if you yeah, if you um, multiply this out, you will see that that it comes directly to this here, right? This is this is the trick. So the what we compute is. is the parameters of this kind of Gaussian, right, of this cavity distribution Gaussian, I think there's a factor missing here in front because it's not, not a true Gaussian, but we're actually interested only in M and, and V. Um, and, and these are the parameters that, that come directly out of the algebraic expression here, right? So this is, this is what we have to compute. Um, and now the important thing is now we have this cavity distribution. What we have to do now is we have to multiply the cavity distribution with the true factor. And this true factor now is, again, our sum of two Gaussians, right? For this particular data point. Right? So that means what we have here is some kind of Gaussian shaped thing times a sum of Gaussians, right? And again, I'm not doing all the details of this computation here. This is just if you do a little more computation on that, then you get used to it, uh, to work with these Gaussians. The nice thing is that this is all Gaussian, right? So things in the end turn, turn to be Gaussian. So that means in integrating over this here gives you this, this sum here, right? This is exactly this uh, expression here, right? So there's th th uh, three things you have to compute for this distribution, for the product of the cavity times the true factor at n, which is the zeroth moment, simply the, um, yeah, the, the uh, integral over all parameters theta here of this product here, right, the normalizer, and of course the other two moments you have to compute, right? And uh, why do we do this? Well, the other two moments of this thing, the, the mean and the variance of this distribution here, uh, will then be used to create this Q nu di uh, distribution. As Q nu is, is, a, is an another Gaussian that has mu and sigma the same as this distribution. Right, this is the whole trick. This is not a Gaussian, right? This is not a Gaussian. This is the problem. This is a product of a Gaussian with a sum of Gaussians. But what we do is we, we approximate that with a Gaussian that has the same mean and variance. And we can compute mean and, mean and variance from this factorization. This is the whole trick, right? Computing mean and variance is easier than to work with this whole thing. Right? This is the whole trick. And now we have a new Q nu which again is now a nice Gaussian distribution, and we can use that to now divide again our cavity distribution and, and multiply the normalizer, and we get another, a better representation of our factor, Fn, right? And this again, it has a Gaussian-like like formulation, but it's not a true Gaussian, right? It can have negative variance, for example, and stuff like that. So it, it can be, uh, this is just, yeah, it's, it's not, a, not a real distribution. It's just a factor of a bigger distribution, and that distribution is then a true, a true Gaussian. But this simple factor doesn't have to be a true Gaussian, right? Is that kind of clear? And of course, then you do this, you iterate over all these factors, and, um, and in the end, you have some convergence criterion, and, and then what you have is, 
the result is um, you get, let me see this, show you this. You get, for every of these factors, we, we now have these parameters, S, N, M, N, and V, N, right? And from these, these you can plug in here, right, to find the M and the V, right? This is then just multiplying these factors again into this spherical Gaussian, where the spherical Gaussian has, a, has an M and a V, right? And now you have a nice representation. Now you have a Q that approximates your P in the sense of KL divergence. Right? It's very close to P, and now you can find the best theta of that, which is simply M now, right? Because now you know this is a Gaussian. You want to find the, the, the highest, uh, the most likely, or the, 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 the one the theta which is that maximizes this Q here, right? So the, the posterior, maximum or posterior, uh, and then it's, of course, just the M, right? Because now, it, now it's a simple Gaussian, right? Now Q is a simple Gaussian, which is, of course, the um, approximation to the true uh, posterior. Okay. Um, and this is just a visualization of, the, uh, of this little example here. Um, this is just two different kinds of, of factors. So the, the blue curve shows the true factor. In this case, of course, we can show this true factor. We can, it's, it's a nice example. We can show this. Right, um, the red curve is now the approximation to that true factor, and now we see that it can be something which is not a Gaussian. Right, in this case, it's a, it's a negative variance, and it's still a Gaussian shape, but it's just turned around. Right, <laughs> but it doesn't matter because we only want to approximate the blue one with the red one, and uh, it, it's interesting to see that the approximation is accurate in the area where the cavity distribution um, is, uh, it, where, where this intersects the true factor, right? So the intersection of the cavity distribution here with the true factor, with the blue curve, right, in this area here, yeah? so the, the cavity distribution defines the area, the interval in which the approximation is, is, is good, right? This is another interesting thing to look at. So same here, right? The green one is the cavity distribution. And in the area of the cavity distribution where the cavity distribution is, is non-zero, right? And all the rest is, is zero. Just here it's non-zero. And in that area, the uh, approximation is, tr is good, right? Cavity distribution kind of tells you where to look at, where to, uh, yeah, where to map your true factor, right? This is just another factor here. Um, the cavity distribution is important, but it's not that you, vary, uh, you, you, can, you can use that kind of information, but what you actually want is, of course, uh, the uh, factorization. So in the end, it's, it's the factors that you want, right? These factors, these F tilde factors, these red, these red curves, is just a product of all these red curves. Um, and these give you then like a, a simpler uh, way of expressing your posterior, right? Just as a product of these factors. But yes, you have to, it's like to, to, to reach these factors, you have to, in every step, find these cavity distributions, which itself has parameters. So you, you estimate parameters of something that you probably don't know, need in the end, but you need it in this intermediate step. That's right. Okay. Um, this is just a summary of the whole lecture about variation inference. I think as I said this already last time. Variation inference, is, uh, inference algorithms use the approximation of functions, so we don't have exact uh, ways to do inference here, right? Variation of inference is very often is, 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 is uh, approximate um, in a sense that it minimizes the KL divergence uh, of some approximation to the true um, posterior or whatever distribution you would like to you do, uh, um, approximate or uh, maximize. Um, there's, I said, mean field theory that was uh, handled last week. And, and now I just uh, gave an example of the exploitation propagation algorithm. Uh, another important example where EP is used is in the context of Gaussian processes, where um, if you use a Gaussian process classifier, the problem there is that um, the uh, likelihood that you use is a sigmoid function, right? So the likelihood is simply uh, the uh, probability uh, 
um, of um, the um, uh, so once you have the, the, the Gaussian pr uh, prior, right, you, you should use the Gaussian process as a prior information. Um, and now if you look at the data, then you say the probability of a data point is, is, a, is a sigmoid function of, um, of, the, of the latent function. And the problem there is if you use the sigmoid function um, and you multiply that with, with the prior, then what comes out is not a Gaussian anymore. Right? And the trick now is to approximate that with a Gaussian. Uh, I think we had that already when we talked about Gaussian processes, but what we did then was to use the uh, Lapla Laplace approximation to find this Gaussian, and now we can use also expectation propagation that is usually a much better approximation than the Laplace. Right? So if you use G GPs, then it's a very good idea to use uh, expectation propagation for, for the um, classification, for the, for, for to approximate the, um, yeah, the posterior. Okay. Um, if there's no questions on that, then I would go to the next topic. Um, and this is a topic um, that will be handled this week, and I think next week we'll also have more specific um, uh, algorithms and ideas about that. Um, it's about sampling methods. And sampling is um, another way uh, to do approximate inference. So uh, one idea, the one apart from looking at variational inference, what we can also do is we can also use sampling methods. And um, sampling methods has, have a, a long history. They are widely used in uh, computer science. Uh, I'm sure you have already seen algorithms that do sampling. Um, the idea is to approximate a deterministic algorithm and to represent uncertainty, also with a parametric model. Th these are the different kind of use cases for sampling methods. Um, and what we can also do is we can ha have uh, a higher computational efficiency with a small approximation error, right? So we um, very often are much, much faster when we do these kind of techniques, uh, of course, with the cost that we are not very, that, that we are not exact, right? We are approximate, but very often with this approximation error can be small. In general, these kind of methods here are called Monte Carlo methods. Um, and this is just one very simple example of such a Monte Carlo method, and I'm sure you might have seen that um, already. Uh, here the, uh, the goal is to integrate um, the, uh, or to, to compute the, um, the area of the circle, which means basically integration, so that we want to find uh, yeah, the area here. And what we can do is, to, to compute that, uh, we can easily sample from a square, which is just the box around, around the circle, right? And then use the fraction of inliers, right? We could just count how often is a point inside and how often is the point outside. And this fraction is a good approximation, right? If you mu multiply that fraction with the box size, in this case it's one, or it's two actually. Yeah, two, four, two, two times two is four. Um, then uh, if you multiply this fraction with the box size, then we have a good approximation of the area of the, uh, of in this case, the circle, but it could also be another shape, right? If you want to have another shape inside, and we have a nice, of course, what we need to do is we need to find, we have an, uh, a good function, a fast function that uh, tells us if a point is inside or not, right? If you can do that quickly, if you can compute quickly the uh, uh, um, membership here, inside or outside, then we can use that sampling technique to um, find the area of that shape. In general, um, this is a non-parametric representation. We don't really um, have a particular model that we uh, maximize with some parameters. Um, instead, uh, we have some uh, samples drawn from distribution, and these, all these samples, they can be also interpreted as hypotheses, right? We say this is a, po a potential representation or a potential uh, yeah, representation of that distribution. Um, the advantage here is that we don't have a restriction of, this, uh, of the type of distribution, right? So if we, for example, if we uh, try to fi fit uh, Gaussian into a data, then we kind of assume that the, the data is actually Gaussian distributed, but we don't know that, right? I mean, this is just an assumption from us, but who, who tells us and, and are we really certain about, about that? Right? So, um, of course, in general, this, this kind of should work, but very, uh, it can happen that 
that your model that you assume about the data is, is the wrong model, and then even if you find very good parameters for your model, uh, you will never be able to predict well because the whole model is, is, is already wrong. Whereas if you do this non-parametrically with, with samples, for example, if you represent this, this whole thing as a set of samples, then, um, then you don't have this restriction, right? You don't, you're not, you don't stick to a certain model. Um, so this is just an example of how, how this could be, uh, be. So this is like two distributions, and one, of, one way, of course, to uh, represent this distribution is just giving a function, right? The, the probability density function of these distributions. Um, and the other one is um, to really sample from that distribution, right? In this case, it, this should be a Gaussian, this is just some other kind of shape here. And then only these samples are your representation. This is what you work with, right? This is the distribution that you work with. And um, so this is uh, a very common way of doing that. Uh, the problem here, of course, or the question is, how can we draw from, how can we take these samples, right? Uh, from, from this given um, distribution, right? If you have a, a given distribution F, then it's important to find ways for uh, arbitrary distributions, for arbitrary functions, to, to get samples from them so that they're distributed uh, like the function tells you. And um, <coughs> I'm going to show you a, a number of techniques now, uh, how we can do that, how we can sample from arbitrary distributions. And the first one is the, uh, let's say, uh, it's probably the most simple one, which is um, that um, we assume we have, again, uh, our function here, the red, red function uh, P here. And what we want to do is we want to find samples right, that, that are distributed according to that um, probability distribution function. And I think before I ex explain that a bit more in detail, I'll have to um, go to big, big the st big step uh, backwards and, and tell you a bit um, what, uh, what this actually means, right? So first of all, um, we assume that we have um, um, continuous variables here. So there's a continuous distribution. And um, what this actually means is, all right, we want to have samples so that when this function is high, we have many samples, and when the sam function is low, we have uh, low samples. Um, the um, big question, first of all, is, um, let's say we have a very simple distribution, a uniform distribution. Uh, the first question uh, I always is, what is the probability that x equals a certain c, right? c, for example, c b 0.5 or something like that. Um, I'm asking this because this kind of gives you, um, it's, it's very often not so easy for uh, people that have not so much uh, background in, in statistics and in probability theory to understand what this is a difference between this uniform distribution and, uh, uh, sorry, about this uh, continuous distribution and, and discrete con uh, distribution. So um, what I mean by this is that the distribution for every one point, the, the probability of, of every one point given, given a certain value is always zero, right? The probability that x equals z, z c is zero for all c, right? Why is that? Why is that? Because it's a... a yes, exactly. That's right. So this is the, 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 the thing I want, want to aim for. So if you pick a, a, sing, a single point in that, in that uh, space here, then every single point is unlikely to have, or is, is there's no uh, um, probability mass, right? There's, it's, it's zero, because uh, you can think of this, there's, there's so many others that it's completely unlikely that this happens. However, what you do is actually, uh, this, this distribution here, this P distribution, if it's uniform, for example, um, then, um, what this p function actually tells you is it only gives you um, the probability that a given uh, sample is in a, in, a, in a given interval, right? So if you have a given interval of two points here, then, then p, the distribution p, simply gives you the probability that a sample is in that interval. And p is simply the area of that um, under, under, under your distribution, right? If your distribution is, is uniform, then it's just that value. In this case, when you have a, like a more complicated um, distribution, like the red one, 
something like this, I have another peak here, then P simply gives you the probability of, for a given P is um, simply all the cases that, this, that a sample is smaller than X, right? Uh, um, yeah, so this is it's this area here, right? That means the area of, of exactly this, uh, under this curve here, uh, is the probability that a given sample is, is smaller than X, right? You say, uh, for example, what you can do is um, a given sample X prime is smaller, or X prime is smaller than your given sample X, right? And this is for all X. Right, your distribution is defined like that. If this is if this is the case for every sample, the probability of being smaller or equal to x, right, is the area of that. Then you have a, a valid um, probability distribution function, a PDF. This is the PDF. And what that means is that what you actually need is not the p, the PDF. What you actually need is the CDF. The CDF is the cumulative distribution function, which is nothing else than the integral, which is defined here as the h function. The CDF of that is simply h of y is simply the integral from minus infinity to the current y of your distribution p of y dy hat. Right? So this is what you actually need right, to be able to compute this, this um, uh, probability. That means if you want to sample, then you need to find samples that are that are according to that cumulative uh, distribution function, right? So that means, um, well, let's say we have this, com uh, this uh, cumulative di distribution function, that means we can now write the probability that a certain sample, it's called a sample u in this case, it's another kind of uh, notation, um, if that's the probability that the sample is smaller than a value of my cumulative distribution function, let's say, I'll call it h, Sorry. This is exactly the same as h of x, right? This should be. This is this is what we aim for. We'd like to find samples so that the probability of being smaller than this is equal to h, right? And now, the trick is to apply the inverse of the cumulative distribution function on both sides because this is the same as h to the minus 1 of u equals, equals no, a small, a lower equal to x, right? And th with, this, with this formula, we can now find an algorithm to equally sample from, uh, from the p function, right? How do we do this? Well, u, we can now uh, think of u as a probability as a, as a uniform distribution, right? We sample uniform between 0 and 1 because the, the, the cumulative distribution function h is goes between 0 and, zero and 1, right? Then we apply the inverse of h and we find a sample that fulfills exactly what we want, right? We find a sample, in this case, x, pri x prime, which is exactly this sample here, which has this probability, right? It has the probability h of x. Is that kind of clear? So the algorithm simply is very, very simple. I sample uniformly on the y-axis and then go back on s until I reach and until I intersect with the cumulative di distribution function with the blue curve and I go down and, s and look at which, which kind of x is that. Right? And if I do it repeatedly, very often, first I sample uniformly here, they go project back and, and look where the x corresponds to. Then I will find a distribution that is uh, exactly that that uh, obeys the uh, distribution function of p, right? The red one. That's a very nice algorithm, but it's very it, it <laughs> of course requires a number of things. First of all, it requires that we need that we have to know uh, the the CDF, of course. Sometimes this is probably not possible. And not only the CDF, we have to be able to invert the CDF. Right? So sometimes this is not possible. And then we have to find other ways to sample from that distribution. OK? So um, for that reason, there are other techniques here. And one other technique is called uh, rejection sampling. 
Um, rejection sampling, again, we have a uh, blue curve here, and we'd like to find samples from that uh, PDF. Um, First of all, uh, there's this assumption that P of Z uh, is smaller for, for, uh, than, than one for all Z. So the uh, trick now is to sample first uniformly Z, sorry, Z here, Z on this axis, and then sample for that given Z, sample between zero and one, right? Again, uh, we, we assume that our blue function is, is smaller than one, that means uh, if we sample at this position between 0 and 1, then um, we are certain that we are uh, within the bounds of the blue curve. Right? This is the reason why we assume this thing here. Later we can say uh, if we have another value, uh, that is probably not 1, but some other value which is the maximum of the blue curve, or bigger than the maximum, then this also works. Right? It doesn't have to be 1 here. It's just to, to simplify it. but. What we, what we have to guarantee is that in the next step, when we sample from, uh, from zero to, to the maximum value, um, we have to uh, make sure that we uh, are within the bounds of the blue curve. So what we do now is we sample uh, from zero to, to one, right? Um, this is C, sorry, it's the, op the opposite order. Yeah, we sample here, and now we compute the probability of Z here, right? We say, how likely should that be, that sample? And if we say that the sample is, um, that the prob probability according to the blue curve is lower than C, then we reject it. We say, well, this, is, this was the wrong one, right? This was uh, a wrong sample, we reject it, and we sample again. Start a new sample, sample again from, sorry, the C again, right? And uh, now once we have the C, the new C, we look at if it's smaller or bigger than P of Z. In this case, it's actually smaller, then we keep it. Uh, this is a very simple algorithm. We just do this over and over again, so we keep it. And um, by this, if we do that, you can already imagine that in areas where the curve, the blue curve is very high, we don't reject very, uh, we, we almost never reject, because uh, the probability, w once we sample in that area, the probability of uh, retaining that sample is much, much higher than in this area, right? If we have another sample here, the probability of rejection is much higher, right? Because in all these cases, I reject. In only this case, I don't reject, right? So this is um, the intuition why this rejection sampling actually works. And this is a general way. The general case is just instead of having um, uh, the bound, a given a uh, fixed curve uh, uh, here as a bound we can have we can have another uh, another curve in this case the blue curve here where we know it's easier to sample from that blue curve right so this is the trick we um we sample from that blue curve that means we are we know that we are under the blue uh, uh curve here um but we don't know if we are also under the red one so we have to do that uh, in the same way. We sample first on this x-axis, then we sample from zero to the value of this blue curve, and um, then we uh, reject if we are between in the gray area. Right? The gray area is, is the rejection area. The reason why we do this with this blue curve here now is that you can imagine if we use uh, just a, a, a uniform uh, maximum here of, of the whole range, then the rejection area is much, much higher, right? All this here is rejected. In all this area, we, we don't use the, the samples. And that is a problem, especially if we are in many dimensions, because uh, if you imagine this, this is one dimension, you take now 10 or 20 dimensions, then the rejection area is, 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 uh, grows exponentially. And that is uh, a very big problem for the efficiency of the algorithm, because then you almost always reject and reject and reject. If you want to have a certain number of samples, you have to wait very, very long until, until you don't reject some. Right? Yeah. So this is what you do. You sample from Q, which is the blue one, and, um, and then you sample uniformly from zero to, to, uh, to the maximum of Q. Well, in general, it's still the case that rejection sampling is inefficient, right? Because it's very hard to find these bounding um, distributions Q, right? Uh, 
particularly for, again, for uh, high dimensions. Okay, uh, let's have a short break and then go on. Okay, um, we um, go on. Um, we had in the uh, in the other the last slide we are uh, talking about rejection sampling, uh, and we said that rejection sampling is inefficient, um, particularly in high dimensions. And for that reason, there's another uh, clever algorithm which is called important sampling. Uh, here, the idea is to assign an importance weight to each sample, um, and this importance weight represents with that importance weight, you can uh, more refine or finer represent your distribution, right? So um, the uh, intuition of the importance weight is that we can account for the difference, kind of in a sense of difference or quotient fraction, between P and Q, right? Uh, P and Q, uh, we have uh, a proposal distribution, which is the red one here in this example here, and we have a target distribution, right? And the proposal is uh, chosen so that we can easily sample from it, right? This is just um, a, a nice way of doing it. We, we assume that we have already given some kind of distribution that, that is easy, for example, a Gaussian. We know how to sample from Gaussians. Um, and if we use a Gaussian as a proposal, then we sample from that Gaussian, right? So the uh, density of these um, samples is according to the Gaussian. Right? It's not exactly like that, but you can think of this. Like here it's more dense than here and here. Um, but the, the values of these uh, weights, they are according to the fraction of uh, the proposal and uh, the target and the proposal, P divided by Q, right? So if you do this, then you get uh, the, um, the weights. So P is, is the target and Q is the proposal as before. Now, uh, why does this work? And this is the explanation of uh, the, this algorithm here. So the probability, we said this already uh, earlier, we, this is again uh, all... Um, continuous. So now that means that the probability that a certain sample uh, is in a, in a given interval A is simply the area under the curve P, right? This is what we would like to guarantee. We'd like to find um, samples so that the probability of a sample falling into this A uh, is according to the um, area of A under the curve, right? What that means is we can now compute the expectation over uh, the distribution P, which is our unknown target distribution P, uh, of the indicator function, right? The indicator function simply says, does X belong to the interval, yes or no, right? E I of X in, uh, element of A is just the indicator function. It's true if, if X is inside A and it's zero, right, outside of A. And the formulation for the expectation of that is simply, uh, the uh, interval of the probability of Z times its value, which is the, the value of the indicator function, right? And now the, uh, the trick is to write this in a slightly different way. We say the integral of P of Z times the uh, indicator function DZ. This is the same as, and now I use the uh, proposal distribution. I multiply it and by I divide by it, right? First I divide, divided by Q of Z, times Q of Z, times the interval, right? The indicator function of the interval. This is just exactly the same, right? I divide and I multiply. Now I can see this is already my W. This is the definition of W. And what remains is, now we can write this slightly different, slight or order that a little bit. This is the same as Q of Q of Z times W of Z times indicator function. Just turn things around. And now we have an expression. We now go back into the uh, 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 writing as a... Um, expected value. This is the expected value under the distribution Q of W of Z times the indicator function. Right? So this is exactly the same as, as we had here. We th this first step is just a step backwards, right? This is just, this is our value of the function and this is its prob uh, probability, 
problem. So we have now the expected value of this function under this distribution. And this is now an easier distribution. This is the whole trick about it. This Q is easy to sample from. The P is not easy to sample from. Right? Now I can generate samples on Q and approximate that expected value with a sum of samples. Right? I think I do this on the next slide. Right? So we have this, this here, which is this formulation. Right? And we say the expectation of a P of this indicator function, which is what we, what we look for, is the same as the expectation on the Q where we use the weights in front of the uh, indicator function. Right? And that again can be uh, approximated with a number of samples, L samples, number of L samples, where every sample has a weight, right? And the, the sample itself corresponds or uh, represents that interval, right? Every sample represents an interval and the uh, uh, W represents the, uh, the weight of that sample, right? And this is the, the whole trick. This is why this works. Uh, where we can now approximate a, um, our, our sample from a distribution P by using a distribution Q with weights. And so the algorithm, the, the most important algorithm where this is used is the so-called particle filter. And I'm showing uh, some examples of the particle filter here, where this is used and how this is used. Uh, the particle filter itself, uh, again, is a non-parametric implementation of the base filter. I think base filter was something we had in the very, very first lesson. Right? We talked about base filter, how this looks like. Uh, in the particle filter, the belief, the posterior of the belief, or belief posterior, is represented by a set of random state samples. So we don't have uh, a parametric representation, but instead we have just a number of samples right, that, that represent that that's the belief. Uh, of course, this representation is approximate, right? We never have the real distribution. We only have hypotheses from that distribution. And um, we can, the, the good thing about this is that we can now use that to represent distributions that are not Gaussians, right? If, if we assume things are Gaussian, then uh, we, we are restricted to this mo model of a Gaussian. But very often we don't have Gaussian distributions. And, and then by using the, Gauss the particle filter, we can then represent more more general distributions. Yeah. Um, also, nonlinear transformations. This is something that is just an, uh, an information for you. This is just uh, to say that we can now uh, map these uh, uh, samples with, with nonlinear transformations, which is not so easy if we do this parametrically. OK. Um, now, this, the basic principle of the algorithm is um, we have a set of state hypotheses, particles. Right. Every particle is, an, is a hypothesis, or is a sample. And um, you can think of this as the survival of the fittest, right? This is like uh, the, the whole idea. Now, this is again the formula of the base filter algorithm. Um, and this is the, um, the algorithm again, right? I'm just showing this uh, here for uh, completeness and to, to, to explain this again, right? We have now uh, we have sender measurements. Uh, if, if D is a center measurement, then we, we go into this uh, uh, subtree. And if D is an action U, then we go into this subtree. I think that I, I said this already. I'm not going to this again. Um, this is just a general base filter uh, um, algorithm. And now we can use um, samples to represent uh, our distributions, right? So what we have here is we have um, XT, which are uh, state hypotheses, right, of our uh, belief state, um, and for every state hypothesis, we have also an importance weight, right? And the number of samples is uh, m, right? And our this is th this represents now the uh, yeah this is our representation over over our uh, current belief state, right? This is just the set of hypotheses uh, along with their with their weights, um, and the uh, samples they represent now the probability distribution p of x, where you simply say uh, you, you sum up uh, the so point mass of direct Dirac distribution here over every sample times its weight. Right? This is the, the mathematical formulation of your of a mapping from a set of samples to a to a distribution. Okay. Now the uh, particle fil filter algorithm itself uh, can be um, formulated like this here. So you have um, you start with um, an uh, empty set. Right. Then, uh, for you have a for loop, 
over, over a number of samples. You sample from uh, the um, um, proposal distribution, which in this case is the um, um, uh, action model or the, uh, yeah, so uh, you, s you assume that this is a distribution that is easy to sample from. We had this already. We, have, we are in a previous state, right? We have some assumptions that we are in a previous state. Um, we do some action UT, and for that uh, previous state and the action T, we know the probability of reaching a new state XT. And this is the distribution that we can sample from. This is, can be a Gaussian, for example. For example, if uh, we do localization with a robot, then uh, given that we are in a state x t minus one, and the robot moves a certain uh, number or amount of uh, uh, distance, then we can say the uh, probability of reaching a certain um, uh, point in, in in space is is a Gaussian around this around this motion that we that we add to the state, right? So we sample from that Gaussian. Then what we do is we compute the um, weight, and the weight in this case is simply our likelihood. This is what we had in also in the uh, Bayesian filter um, equation here. This is just the uh, observation likelihood, so we, uh, this is the probability of observing a z value z given that we are in the state xt. Right? So this, this again is also something that we, that we are given uh, beforehand. This is our likelihood model. But now we don't have to sample, we just have to assign it to this W thing, right? We say the probability of, w of, this, the, of this is exactly the, the W because now what we actually do is in the end, we, we can kind of imagine this already, we, we multiply the W with the, uh, uh, the, the prior with the uh, likelihood and then we get it posterior, right? This is the whole, whole idea of Bayesian filtering, uh, likelihood times prior is posterior. Um, and in, in particle filters, it turns out to just be, uh, like the weights just have to be uh, the, the probability distribution of the likelihood, right? Um, and this doesn't have to be Gaussian, right? It can be something else. This is just some formulation to do that. And now we just add these new, new samples to our set of samples, right? Along with this, so we have a new XT and we also store the WT. This is the, uh, the sampling step, right? And now important, uh, this is what's like the, yeah, our, how, we, how we generate the samples. And now um, in party filter, the next step is the so-called resampling step. So now we go again over the samples, but we now we draw every sample with the probability that is uh, that is um, proportional to its weight, right? So we, every sample is is retaken from the set of samples, um, and samples that have high weights are taken more often than other samples, and then they again uh, put into this set of samples, right? So now the resulting set of samples is just the ones that are resampled from from the given sa set of samples here. And then the theory says that these samples here are distributed according to the posterior of, of my model, that, that where, where the prior, right, the prior information, and the likelihood are taken into account, right? And this can then be used for the next prior, for the next round, right? And they take the next action into account and the next uh, observation, right? ZT and UT are observations that are uh, given for the algorithm, right? The algorithm uh, takes uh, this as an, as an input and according to a new uh, um, uh, action and, and observation, uh, I can compute a new posterior of my belief state. Right? And this is an ongoing process. It's an online learning process. For every new input here, I have a new representation of my belief state. Okay, this is just, again, the steps uh, explained. This is sampling from the proposal. The proposal is, 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 is this pr uh, the prior here, right, the prior. Uh, on our uh, XT here. Then we compute the sample weights, which is just the likelihood. And then we do resampling. And to show this in an example, I uh, uh, will show you how um, we can do that, we can use that to localize a robot. And the algorithm is called Monte Carlo localization. Uh, I said this already, sampling methods are very often used Mon Monte Carlo methods. And this is a sampling method, so to do localization with that method, we call it Monte Carlo localization. It has been very efficient, has uh, uh, yeah, been used uh, very widely in robotics, and um <coughs> it's a very interesting and also nice, uh, simple algorithm. <coughs> so <coughs> to do that, um, we first of all say that every particle uh, is, is a hypothesis, and in our case now, hypotheses are um, poses uh, in some space, locations. So every particle is a location of that robot, a hypothesis of that the robot is in that uh, position. 
<coughs> then the proposal distribution is the motion of the robot, right? We have the prediction step. We have um, some kind of uh, model that tells us if the robot moves a certain amount of uh, distance, like a certain uh, distance, then um, we have some kind of probability, some model that tells us how likely is it that the robot is at this position. For example, we can use a Gaussian here again. And then the observation model is used to compute the importance weight. So the, the likelihood of the model of the, of the observation is the so-called correction step, where we just take the, um, this as a, as a weight. And um, yeah, so the in pictures looks, looks like this. Um, assume we have a very simple problem here, a one-dimensional one problem here. So we have a, a, a corridor here, and, along, and, and the robot uh, travels along that corridor, and the aim is now to find the position of the robot uh, in that corridor. And we assume that we have some sensor on the robot that can measure uh, doors, that can measure uh, if the uh, <coughs> robot is in front of the door or not. Right? could be simply a uh, light sensor or something like that that measures if, uh, if I'm in front of the door or not. <coughs> so in the beginning, um, we don't have any knowledge about where the robot could be. And um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and so we um, initialize our um, belief with a uniform distribution, right? We sample uniform over the whole space, and every sample here is just an, a, a pot potential um, position of the robot. Okay, <coughs> this is uh, uniform. Now the first thing we do is um, we observe that hey, that means that we, t we get some sensor input. And um, for every sensor input, what we can do is um, we compute the weight right, for every particle. And the weight is nothing else than our sensor model applied to the particle. Right? The, the weight is simply, we have an observation ZT. Right? We say, yes, I'm in front of the door. And now we can compute that for every uh, position, XT. We can compute now this probability here. Right? We just plug in XT and ZT and say, what if the robot was at this position? What would be the likelihood to measure Z, right? To measure to be in front of the door, and it would be very low. But if we were at this position, if X T is here, then the likelihood of measuring door is very high, right? Again, uh, we assume this is a Gaussian in the case. So this means we have now three Gaussians here: one is here, one is here, and one is here. And these Gaussians directly turn into weights of our particles, right? <coughs> Then the next step, <coughs> the uh, robot moves. And what we do now is we do the resampling step. Right? So from this step here, right, where we have a uniform distribution, we now take th these samples that have a higher weight more often, more likely, than the other, the other things here. Right? So we, we resample. And after resampling, we apply the motion model. Right? So resampling turns into turns this into um, a sampling or a representation where there's dense areas here, right? There's three dense areas of samples, and then the other one are more sparse. That's the one thing, and the other thing is that the whole set of particles is shifted towards the motion of the robot or along the motion of the robot because we apply the motion model, right? And not only shifted but also smooth out a little bit. So the we we, we just uh, apply um, this this um, the, uh, motion model here, and and that just means that we can just shift all the particles uh, in in the way that the, the robot has moved, right? And now again, in the next step, we do again apply our sensor model. Now again, we observe a door, right? We say, ha, ah, here's another door, right? Uh, and we don't know which door it is, right? We just say there's a door, right? Um, but now what, what we can do is we can use that kind of information to again compute our new weights from the current particles. And now we see that um, the, uh, the weights or the particles that are in front of this door are much, much more likely that they, ha they have a much higher, first of all, a higher density and a higher weight. They have both, right? The density comes from the previous, from the prior, from the previous representation from, from the uh, previous step. And the weights now come from our current observation, from our current likelihood model, where you simply say every, every uh, weight now, every particle has the weight according to its um, observation likelihood. Of course, we have also the others here, right? There's some likelihood that we are here and some, some here, but uh, the uh, mass of the particles, right, is kind of here, right? 
And this tells us that the robot is most likely at this position. And why is that? Well, because it has observed the door here, it has moved a certain amount, and has observed another door here, and this kind of uniquely defines you the position of the robot, right? It can only be here, or it can, most likely it is at this position, right? And now if it moves again, then we can say uh, we have one peak, right? We have one um, area where the, where the particles are very dense, and this area can be represented as the, um, the uh, current estimate of the position of the robot. And we can now say that the robot is localized. Okay? Um, now, if you look at some, something closer to the algorithm, uh, these are the particular steps. The first thing is we sample from uh, the posterior, uh, from the proposal, sorry. Um, now the question is, how can we do this? Um, first of all, we can add the, the motion vector to each particle directly. Uh, this, of course, assumes that our motion model is perfect, as we exactly know that if we are in this state and we move three meters, then we are exactly at this other uh, state. This is some way of doing it. Um, it's a simple way, but of course, it kind of neglects the fact that uh, the motion that we do with the robot is not perfect, right? So uh, there, there might be some, um, some noise in there, in that motion. Um, the other thing is we can mo sample from the motion model, right? We have another kind of representation of that motion model, for example, uh, a Gaussian, and we sample from that Gaussian, right? Um, and we have, for example, for a 2D motion, where we have given a translation velocity and a rotation velocity, we have this kind of distribution. Um, we can write it like this here. We can say our, our uh, command that we give to the robot, this is the action that we do, is, is uh, uh, rotation and, um, and, um, and translation. These are the two things here. And this is the, the, uh, the, the 3D uh, position in space where we have x and y, which is the position in space, and theta, which is the orientation. Right, and we can use that to to sample from that from that motion model. I'm not showing the details. So this is just how the sampling could look like. Right, we start here, and <coughs> uh, for every step, if we uh, um, extrapolate our motion model uh, in a number of steps, then uh, we can see that this is the kind of uh, sampling that we get from it. It's not not really a Gaussian because because we have this. Um, oh sorry for the skipping. Um, because we have these uh, orientation parameters here, right? So it's not. If 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 we didn't turn any uh, ever, then we will have kind of Gaussians. But by turning, we'll have these non-Gaussian shaped things. It's called something called a banana shape because it looks like a like a banana sometimes. So this is uh, one way of of doing it. Again, we we sample from that from that distribution. Then the second thing we have to do is we have to compute the importance weight. Um, now, uh, the computation of the sample weights is, um, uh, this is like we want to have the, the target distribution, so that means um, we cannot directly sample from the target distribution, and that's the reason why we do the important sampling step. This is why, why we have actually apply um, uh, particle filtering. And to compute the importance weights, uh, we do exactly what, what I said before. We have the uh, uh, target divided by the proposal, and um, in our particular case, we have the proposal distribution, which is this here, right? This is our, um, from the uh, previous belief, times our, our uh, given motion model, right? Um, and what we actually want is the, uh, the target distribution, F, right? So uh, we want to sample from this. And to do that, we need to find the weights, right? And the weights are simply F divided by G. And if you just plug this in here, now this is again all base rules here, base formula here, here. This is just uh, what we had uh, before. This is just the likelihood times the prior times the belief. And this is just the, um, uh, again, the prior times the belief. And this cancels out. And in the end, we, it just the, the likelihood just remains, right? This is the nice, nice thing about this. This is just the proof that the weight of this particle here for every particle is simply the uh, observation likelihood. Okay. Um, and yeah, and this is something about the uh, kind of sensors that we could use here. Um, so this is just uh, 
question, how can we obtain such a, such a um, sensor model, right? And, um, and the answer is by, uh, by calibration, right? So what we do here is we have, um, we, we have an environment where we exactly know the distance, right? And we measure a distance, and then we compare the known distance with the, um, with the measured distance. So here, for example, uh, I think this was two and a half meter or something like that. So this was a laser sensor that, that measured a certain distance, and, and this is the, um, the, the probability that we get out of the, uh, the, the, la uh, the laser measurement. So the, the blue curve here right, is, is, um, is a noisy representation. Um, and what we can do is now we can now fit some kind of model into that um, measurement. Again, we can do a Gaussian, and here this is another one which, is, which accounts for all the um, probabilities that we have max range, right? So this is five meters and everything uh, above uh, five meters. So that's the reason why probability goes very much up here, right? So the solar sensors are very sim similar, but uh, it's, it's just, more, just more noisy, right? This is one kind of probability distribution that we could use here uh, as a likelihood, as, a, as, a, as an observation likelihood. And the final step is the resampling step, right? Uh, and now the question is, how can we implement that? Um, I don't know why this is... Uh, okay, there's a problem here with the, uh, with the slides. Uh, something is going on wrong here. Sorry. Yeah, so we have a given set of uh, weighted samples. We want a random sample where the probability of uh, drawing xi is equal to, is, is um, proportional to the weight. It's not equal, but proportional to the weight, right? Um, and usually we do this m times um, with replacement. That means we will have some samples uh, more than once. Uh, this is probably not, it's, it's not a big problem, but like, uh, if you don't want that and there's other ways of doing that, you could then um, uh, add a little noise to every sample so that you don't have the exact sample again. Um, but important to note is uh, how do we do the resampling step? And there's um, one uh, algorithm which is called the roulette wheel. Um, I think it's also uh, like, yeah, you, you can, can think of this as, um, as, a, as a wheel where you um, sample from, first of all, um, along the um, um, circumsphere of this, of this uh, circle here. And um, what we do is uh, you, um, all, all the weights of all the particles are, are uh, shown here uh, around the circle here. So that means a higher weight has a higher section of the circle, like W3, for example, is a very high weight. And um, this has a higher, higher section of the circle. And, um, and, and the idea is now to sample, to resample a number of um, particles so that, that particles that have higher weights are taken more often than the other ones. And this you can do with in two steps, first of all, two different uh, uh, ways. One is simply now going again uh, a number of times, uh, m times, uh, around this uh, uh, circle here and, um, and sample m times, right? Uh, then you would have, um, for example, this one would be uh, uh, taken very often, this one would not be very taken very often, this one also not very often. So this is a standard n times sampling technique, right? You just sample n times and you do, um, uh, and for every time you, you, you look at in which, which uh, sample you, you reached. Uh, the problem with that is that it requires uh, more particles. Uh, this is, you can show that, that this is, th this is true. And um, it also has this complexity of n log n, right? Um, why? Because you have n times, uh, you have to do a search uh, in, in, this, in this space here where in, which, in which particle you are. And a more efficient algorithm to do that is, uh, is this one here, where, ah, sorry, where instead of sampling n times, you sample, you sample only once, right? You first sample uh, a value between um, zero and one for the first uh, sample, and then you just go around uh, a certain a number of times around the circle, right? And the number of times is simply the sum of all weights divided by the number of particles that you have. So this section here, this, this section that you take here, is um, the fraction of the whole circle, right? Uh, that defines you how many particles you actually want, right? This is the number of particles that you want, and you only sample once, and you just step a fixed number, fixed uh, distance around the circle, 
um, and and you get the same um, behavior, right? You have a, a sa the same uh, representation, the same mm, uh, sampling, right? The, the samples will again be uh, according to the to the weights, but uh, inter interestingly here, this is a better sampling technique because you have l you introduce lower variance variance, and it's it's linear in time complexity because you only sample once and then just go around the, the circle, and it's easier to implement. Um, yeah, this is just as a detail for this algorithm um, to, to explain that there's an, a very efficient way of uh, imp implementing uh, rejections, uh, the, the, the resampling step. Yeah, and this is just some example uh, how this could look like. Oh, I think this should be a video and it doesn't, does it play? Oh, where is my pointer? No. This is bad. Why does the video not play? Mm, no, doesn't play. Well, then um, let's show it in a um, number of steps here. This is a, sa a similar, similar environment um, where um, the, uh, the, robot, the true position of the robot is not given here, but um, the um, this is the initial uh, step of the algorithm. So in the beginning, there's no knowledge whatsoever where the robot could be. So we have a uniform distribution of samples of the whole space. And in every step now, uh, we apply um, the uh, re um, particle filter algorithm. So we uh, do uh, a reweighting of the particles and a, and a, and a resampling. And we see that uh, by taking into account the observations that we have in every step and the motions, um, we have, uh, after some uh, number of steps here, we have um, areas where the robot is more likely to, <coughs> likely to be than in other areas, right? So this is already something which is much more, let's say, uh, it gives you much more knowledge about where the robot could be, but we have still a number of positions, so we're still not very clear where the robot could be. But after a certain amount of, of observations, we have one big blob here, right? Which is then tells you this is the most likely position of the robot. And that once you have that, you can also then track back, right? Once you have the most likely position, then for every particle, that's also interesting to know that every particle can maintain uh, its estimate where, it where the robot has been before. And by doing that, you can find the most likely path, right? You can just track back and say, what's the most likely path uh, that I reached, that, that I did to reach that position? Um, yeah. And then there's one big problem here, which is called the kidnap robot problem. Uh, here, um, the, the problem is that uh, f so, f so far this works, works only for, um, for tracking, right? So you need some kind of initial um, estimate where the robot could be, and then, or even if it's uh, um, uniform. The problem is w once you're localized, uh, you have to stick to that. Um, estimation. Uh, if you if you then move the robot somewhere else, then uh, your representation, your your guess where the robot could be, could be wrong. And then if you resample, then you would lose most of the particles, and you would uh, lose the robot. Um, and to do that, what we can do is in every resample step, you can uh, introduce the uh, possibility that the robot has moved. Um, and you can do that by sample by uh, introducing like uniform samplings samples at every step, right? So you always keep the hypothesis, uh, the potential hypothesis that the robot has moved by simply introducing uh, samples at at random positions somewhere, and then you can, then you keep information that uh, the robot could be there, right? So this is called this is the difference between global localization and local localization. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, so far about applications of sampling methods, and particularly the, um, the uh, particle filter algorithm. Uh, and this summarizes the uh, first part on sampling methods. Um, so we have mainly four different kinds of sampling methods. Uh, this transformation method that I showed in the ve very beginning. Then we have rejection sampling and important sampling. These are the three methods I showed today. And then there's Markov chain Monte Carlo, which I'm showing next week. Um, this is more widely used in machine learning, where the uh, first one is mostly used, or th this one is mostly used in robotics. Um, the transformation is interesting, but it's not very applicable in many cases, right? So, many, many, very, very often you don't have this uh, easy 
uh, setup where you can it, uh, invert the um, cumulative distribution function, so it's not so easy to do that in general. Um, then <coughs> rejection sampling is often very inefficient because uh, you have very often um, a lot of uh, rejections, right? If, you, if the rejection area is very big, then you just wait very long until you get the right samples. And a more efficient way of doing this is important sampling where you use a proposal distribution, a target distribution, and the fraction of both is then used as a weight for every particle. And using the weights, you can represent uh, any kind of distribution using these particles. And efficient implementation of this resampling step is the so-called low variance sampling, where you just go through the uh, roulette wheel only once. You sample only once, and then go through the wheel as often as you want the particles. Yeah, OK, that's it. Thank you for.